thank you so much for that wonderful introduction and thank you for inviting me here to be with you today. I have to tell you, I'm very impressed with this organization. I, NAEP is new to me, uh, but as I prepared for this, I read up on it and then I talked to Mimi at lunch and she shared that NAEP has been in existence for 34 years doing incredible work and as a person who is very passionate about STEM, I appreciate the, uh, I guess, near-term focus from 2007 on on the STEM fields. And I'm just thrilled to be here and impressed with your dedication and commitment for all that you do to inspire our young people to want to consider an opportunity in STEM. Lockheed Martin has, uh, for the last 12 months, been celebrating our 100th anniversary. And and I think that at the end of this month, this is the last time we can actually talk about the 100, so I'm still legal, we can still talk about 100 years. And we have all kinds of videos that celebrate the 100 years to get our employees to see what we've been doing for 100 years. And I have a favorite video, and I have a favorite part of the video, and it has a little boy who's probably about six years old, couldn't be any older than six. And so he's looking up at this F-35 fighter jet. And he's looking up at it, and the narrator in the video says, for a hundred years, we've been putting the awe in awesome. And I just, when, I, when, when that part comes and you see this little boy looking at the possibility of putting the awe in awesome, I think everybody needs to hear it. If we had more time, I would have shown you the video. Everybody needs to see the video because I believe that if we really got to our young people and they really believed, understood and believed that being an engineer meant putting the awe in awesome. Any of you who have children, how often do your children say awesome? I mean all the time, right? I think the floodgates would open and we wouldn't need to talk about this anymore. But for a quarter of those hundred years, I have had the honor to be a part of teams that have been putting the on awesome. I've been, I've worked on projects like, I'll just name a couple of them for you, a project called the Persistent Threat Detection System. PTIDS is the acronym. We've got to have acronyms for everything. And it is basically a blimp. It's an aerostat that flies about 5,000 feet in the air in a mobile station, ground station, and it has surveillance equipment on it. And this system was in Iraq and it's now in Afghanistan. And we'll just tell you a little bit about what it does. It watches what's happening in the environment, and there are many of them there, and it sees when an insurgent comes and plants an IED. And what, it, what the ground operators are able to do when PTID sees this, they're able to alert soldiers and say, don't go that way because there are IEDs there. And then what it's able to do is when those insurgents leave that place and they go home, it's able to find where their home is and it sees them plant and they do, they bury their arsenal of weapons and it allows soldiers to go and capture the weapons and capture the insurgents. The mothers of Afghanistan, because it's this big white blimp in the air, call PTIDs the angel in the sky and they only allow their children to play outside when PTIDs is flying. I started Lockheed Martin, as you said, in 1987, and my first job was a software test engineer. And I did software test engineering, I did software development work, and uh, the first system that I worked on was called, was a U.S. Navy launcher called the Mark 41 Vertical Launching System. It was a launching system that really revolutionized how the Navy fought in that it was multi-mission. Multi-mission means that if there are threats coming from the air, if there are threats coming from land or another ship, if there are threats coming from underwater, it could protect and defend against those threats. And, and so therefore the Navy didn't need as many, um, as many ships because it had launchers on ships that could do many, many things. Well, as a young engineer, I didn't talk a lot about what I did to my family and friends when I came home. And I didn't do that largely because you know, I was developing an assembly code and you know, nobody knew what 8108 was but me and the people who were doing it. That actually means you know, jump eight spaces and go and fill that register. But nobody knew that. I realize now, huge mistake. Huge mistake because that's part of our problem. When, we don't talk, when engineers don't talk about what they do, Nobody else can learn. Nobody else can see that we get to do some pretty cool things. But, so this launching system that I worked on and 
wrote code for, uh, did a pretty important thing that everybody heard about. Do you remember when the rogue satellite was falling from the sky and they were afraid that the fuel tank would come and it would explode? And, well, the Mark 41 vertical launching system was the launcher that shot the missile that shot the rogue satellite out of the sky and saved us all. And so when I, <laughs> as I, <laughs> and so when, when that happened, I said, oh, I can actually share what I do and they'll understand it. <laughs> and, and so that was really cool. Right now I support, a lot of my career was in defense. Right now I support the civil agencies for the, for the U.S. government as well as for some international uh, governments. And I do many different, our teams do many different things. One of the things that we do is we support the Federal Aviation Administration and we write air traf traffic management systems that actually control the safe travel of aircraft in about 60% of the world's space, uh, airspace. And so just amazing things and I have to tell you I'm so grateful for the opportunity to be able to do this. And when I was a student, <clears throat> I never dreamed that I would have this opportunity. I never dreamed that I would have it because I am quite the accidental engineer. And I have worked for Lockheed Martin for 26 years and I have never been bored. There are not many careers where you can say that. I have never been bored. I, every day hadn't been beautiful. So, okay. <laughs> but I haven't been bored and I want to shout that from the rooftop so people can understand how exciting a career in engineering can, a career in engineering or any of the STEM fields can be because we don't get it here. We don't get it in the U.S. So I'm just going to throw out a few stats. I'm not going to throw out a lot of them. If you compare us to Asia, 21% of college graduates in Asia had STEM degrees. In the U.S., does anybody know in the U.S. what it was? Under 5%. We, uh, we compete every year internationally in these math, uh, game, math contests. 15 years, a group of 15-year-old students out of 34 countries. Where do you think we placed? Not quite 34th, <laughs> thank goodness, but close, 25th. 25th out of 34. This STEM focus is putting our nation at a, uh, in peril. I and mean, we have been the nation that we are largely because of our technological advancements. And so we must keep a focus on that. In the underrepresented minority category, it's even worse. So I'll speak from African American and Latino perspective. We are 28% of the U.S. population. Yet in the STEM fields, we represent under 7%. By 2020, it is estimated that African Americans and Latinos will be a third of the U.S. population. By 2050, which really isn't that far away, 42%. Yet, this group is the group that is least likely to consider a career in STEM education. It is a phenomenon that cannot continue to ha and, and for us to be the nation that we are. So I talked about being an accidental engineer and I, I mean that because when I think about how I got here, there were so many things that could have gotten in the way of my being able to tell you those first three stories of the incredible systems that I had the privilege of working on. And um, I'll just give you a couple examples. So when um, I was I was in middle school and I'm the youngest of three girls and we were all educated in the Baltimore City public school systems. So in middle school it's time to choose what high school you're going to go to and I knew what high school I was going to. And I thought I was going to be a psychiatrist when I was in middle school so I didn't know everything but I knew what high school I was going to. I was sure of it. My sisters had gone there. I was going there too. It was Western High School, the oldest all-girls high school in the country. It was then, it is now, it still is all girls. And they had an A-course college preparatory program that pr was a much like the magnet programs we have now except it was their standard very advanced curriculum. So I went into my counselor's office. I was, oh by the way, a very good student. Um, not all A's, but mostly all A's because when I brought my grades home, if I had 95, my daddy said, where are the other five points? And he was serious. I mean, he was serious. Like, Every, 98, where are the other two points? I'm like, give me a break. Fortunately, mommy was hugging me, so this was good. But I'll tell you, so I, good grades, but I did terribly on standardized tests. Do you remember the Iowa State test? The California Achievement Test? Those things kicked me right where it hurts. I mean, it was terrible. So when I went in to my counselor, I said, here, I'm going to Western High School, I'm applying, this is where we're going. And she says to me, Stephanie, 
I don't recommend that. I don't think we should apply there. I think you ought to go to your zoned high school for the ninth grade, and then you ought to apply next year for Western's B course. You have a better chance. You probably won't get in. I was crestfallen. I went, my mother picked me up from school. I got in the car, and I just burst into tears. And she says, what is wrong? And I told her. And she said, stop crying. Don't let anybody define you. Don't let anybody steal your joy. We're going to Western. We applied to Western. I went to Western. I graduated from Western in the A course with honors, went back to the middle school. Now, now be, be, care, be, be clear. <laughs> I did go fast, but, but be clear. I did not go with a spirit of animosity. I did not go with a spirit of anger because while I was a great student, I didn't test well. Okay? So it was possible that I wouldn't get in. My counselor was really trying to protect me. And I, it, I didn't just, uh, you know, I didn't know that the day of, okay? It took me a while to get there. But she was really doing it to protect me. And that's what counselors are supposed to do. But what counselors are also supposed to do is to help you see the possibility of you. So she should have also seen the possibility in me and not stolen my joy. Fortunately, I had a mother who didn't allow that to happen. So let's fast forward a little bit and I go to college. I am very good at math. I don't know any engineers. My, both of my parents are highly educated and had successful careers. I don't know an engineer. I've never heard of an engineer. When I told my father that I was going to pursue an engineering degree, he thought I was talking about a train. I'm not, I'm not kidding. So I go, to, I go to UMBC. I'm good at math, so what am I going to do? I'm going to be an accountant. So I major in economics, going to get an accounting certificate. And I decide to, you know, you have all these electives you have to take. So I took a chance, and I took a programming class in COBOL. And I'm embarrassed to say this, but Mimi's already told you how old I am. So we had punch cards. I was the last class. I was, I was the last class that had the punch cards. And um, I fell in love. And so I've got this economics major. I've got to declare at some point, and I don't know what I, which way I'm going to go. And so I decided to do both because I just had such a passion for, and, and again, remember, I don't know any engineers. So I'm not quite sure what this whole COBOL computer engineering thing is going to end up with. But fortunately, I had wonderful career, career counselors at UMBC that guided me to internships and all kinds of opportunities to figure that out, whether it would be for my economics degree or for my computer science degree. More jobs were available then, as they are now, in computer science and engineering uh, perspective. So I got internships and I did that. We can't wait for somebody to get into college and meet a career counselor who knows about a job. We, we can't wait for this phenomenon. Those statistics that I share with you and others uh, with women, it's, it's, it's almost as bad with, with women in STEM, as I'm sure you know, as it is with minorities. Not quite, but, but pretty close. So we can't wait that long. And I believe that if more people understood just how exciting this could be, it would be different. Now, you might look at my story and say, Stephanie, that was a long time ago. It's different now. I'm going to tell you, it's not different, and I'm not sure. I know that every day what happened to me, whether it was in middle school or not knowing and not having the resources in my uh, community to direct me to an engineer. I mean, you've got people, especially in the minority community, who don't see role models that look like them in these careers. So even if they know about an engineer, they don't think they can do it. They don't think it applies to them. They certainly don't have anybody sitting down at Sunday dinner telling them about the incredible things that they do, or telling, maybe even more important, telling their parents about what they can do. So a few years ago, um, we started with a high school, a STEM high school, in northeastern Baltimore County, uh, the STEM Academy. And we were partnering with them. And when um, I met with the principal, I asked her, what did she most want us to do? What, how could we be in partnership with her? How could we be most helpful to her? And what she shared, she says, you know, we need books. We certainly need computers because we don't have those, and a lot of those in the public school system. But can you talk to the students? Because the students who are the most qualified to be in the STEM program 
I'm having the hardest time attracting. That was so interesting to me. The students who probably scored very, very well on these Iowa State and California achievement tests, except they don't call them that anymore. Uh, these tests, the MSAs in, in Maryland is what they're called, um, their parents were discouraging them from attending. So what they would say, this STEM Academy had before it uh, was a STEM Academy, was a vocational school. So at this school they have science, technology, and engineering math curriculum, and they also have carpentry and plumbing. And so the principal said, when I talk to the students about the STEM Academy and the possibilities for them, they go home excited. And they come back and they say, Ms. Lowry, I can't do that. I have to do the plumbing track. Because my mother said that if I get a plumbing degree, the probability is very high, 75% of the graduates from that high school that have plumbing degree get jobs. Same thing with carpentry. If you get a carpentry degree, you'll never go hungry. So they know those stats. It's our job to educate them on our stats from a STEM perspective so that they can understand. Lockheed Martin is 120,000 people strong. 120,000 people strong. Over 60% of those are scientists and engineers. Last year, even in a down economy, we hired thousands of engineers. We hired more engineers than we hired any other group of people. My, I, I tell you those stories and the amazing things that I have been really just privileged to work on so that you can share it with somebody else and hopefully the excitement of the opportunities and the possibilities and there's so many can get some of the students excited about it. Certainly the exposure that, that people who uh, look like them can absolutely do it just because you don't see them on television or see them every day when you're in your church or wherever you are, that they can do it too. But everybody wants a job. So this, nor <laughs> so this normally gets people. If you want a job, and if you want a good paying job, our jobs in engineering are some of the highest paying jobs that you can get with a four year degree, in bar none. Except maybe a, you know, a professional athlete, and what's the probability of that? And this is what we need to get in front of our students. So thank you so very much for having me and for your commitment to inspire students to know that they too can put the awe in awesome. Thank you so much. <laughs>